I figured out early on that if I keep looking over my shoulder at the bag of fear or what dark things that are hanging up on over my shoulder, I'm if I keep looking at that, I'm going to get a stiff neck and I'm going to have trouble pulling it back. What we choose to do every day, we have the right to choose whether we're going to enjoy this day or whether we're going to drag ourselves through it. I'd like to welcome to the show Gladys McClary. How are you doing, Gladys? Good morning here in Arizona. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I I am I am honored to have you on the show. You are it's never polite to ask, it's never polite to talk about age when it comes to a woman, but you are uh by far the most seasoned guest I've ever had on my on my uh, on my show. So thank you so much yeah. for doing this. Well, I can actually brag about it. You know, you can get past a certain age and you can start bragging about it. <laughs> That's I guess you're right. After a certain age, you can. Um we're <laughs> We're here to talk about your your new book, The Well Lived Life, a hundred and two year old doctor's six secrets to health, happiness at every age. Uh, you are an inspiration, I have to say. Just oh. your story, where you've come from. My first question to you is: Is it true that you started writing books at in the night in your nineties? Yes, yes. Did you just wake up one morning and said, "You know, I think I'm going to write a book"? No, I. I'd been the practice of medicine, and I'd been working with women who were having babies, mm -hmm. and I wanted to share with them something that I didn't have to tell them every time, every time, every time. So I thought, well, if you write a book, you can you just give it to them. And, um, it, you know, so we started out, so I started out with a book about birthing, and uh, and then it just, but the books before this one were all about medical practice. They didn't they didn't have the juice in them that was what allowed me to be really great grateful that I could practice this art of medicine. And so this last book, it, it I was able to put the juice back in. Beautiful. So tell me, how did you begin your journey in the in the medical field and, and, and actually being, as 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 you've put it, the mother of holistic medicine, which is, well, you know, I'm sure you were doing it at a time that holistic medicine wasn't the, all the rage as it is today. No, we thought up the word. <laughs> <laughs> actually, my parents were medical missionaries in India. Mm -hmm. So they went to India in 1914, just at the end of the war. And my mother was a physician in 1913. Now that's, you know, I I had my degree in 19, at the end of World War II, but hers was at the end of World War I. So they were, my parents were an absolute inspiration to me. And, uh, I knew from the beginning that I well, I not that I was going to be a doctor. I just knew I was because I all my dolls got my and sister my my sister wouldn't let me play with her dolls because my dolls got sick and hers didn't. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, with all the, with all the life that you've lived, what is the most important message you think that the younger generation? needs to consider to learn that life and love are the two essential parts of living because life and love activate each other and they can't function without each other or not really deeply function and the fact that they if if you if you get stuck someplace it's life and love that will move you out of it. And if they don't, it really just stays, just stays stuck. So these are two essential aspects 
of the human being, of us as human beings. Hmm. Over the years, I mean, you've seen so many things come and go since you were born. I was just, I was talking to my wife about it this morning. I'm like, my gosh, she was there for the 30s and the 40s, and the 50s, and all you've seen humanity shift yeah. in your lifetime. And it's been one of the greatest shifts in human history these last hundred years. Yeah. You know, 100, 150 years or so, we have grown so much. What is the biggest surprise for, that you've seen humanity achieve, not only techno technologically, but also spiritually? Well, actually, I'm facing it right now. Tell me. You know, the fact that you and I can do this and talk about the things that, that we feel are important mm -hmm. is a huge, huge step in consciousness. Mm. You know, because this, this is going all around the world. Yes, I'm, it is. I, I had somebody calling this morning from, where was it, John? Um. Bulgaria or someplace, you know, <laughs> it, it just all over the world, people are calling in. And the fact that we can communicate with each other this way, I didn't right. even know what a telephone was when I was growing up. My God. Yeah, you're absolutely right. This is opening up consciousness in a way that, well, the second the internet showed up, it, it really started to change things. And now that oh, this yeah. technology is, yeah, this technology is so well um you know well versed at this point that you're right i mean even a few, even 10 years ago this was not possible oh no no not like I'm, this <clears throat> so to be here and to be able to do this and talk to you mm -hmm. and where are you i'm in i'm in austin texas <laughs> And this right. will go around the world and it will be translated in many languages and it will go around the world. So you will be speaking Chinese and Russian and German and Spanish by the time it's all said and done. So your That's message right. will get out to a lot, a lot of people. And my son, I have a son named Bob, Robert McGarry, who has the Human Potential Center in Austin, Texas. Oh, really? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. We should probably get together. You need to introduce it. Yes, I'll absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. After after the conversation, we'll definitely we'll definitely uh, take our numbers down. Now, right. in, how has how has your spiritual journey evolved over these last hundred and two hundred three years that you've been around? Well, it's it's you know growing up in a, a family or the the pair of my parents were not only uh, uh, doctors, but they were ministers. They went to India with a message of hope for as they reached out to the villagers in India and took their message of hope and healing to the people. That was the message I got. And uh, it's been part of who and what I am, because I chose to make it that. That's beautiful. What what gives you hope about the future of our planet and humanity as you see it today? People like you, because oh. what I'm finding is that as, as we talk about things, people are reaching up for their true humanity. This is what I'm finding, that they... Um, See, I have an idea. Now, this isn't a theology. It's not anything except an idea. Mm -hmm. That when God, whatever God is to each one of us, created the earth and the universe, and it, and he, she looked at it and thought, oh, this is perfect. It's just the way it needs to be. And then he, she created the human being. And he said to us as humans, now you are the only people on this demand or on this universe who I have given free choice. 
So you have the, the right and the ability for to choose whatever direction or whatever thing you want to do, and you have free will. There isn't anything else on this universe that has the same right and responsibility. And so therefore, I give you dominion over the whole universe. And we, in our arrogance, decided, he said, domination. And so we've decided, oh, goody, goody, you know, we can do what we want to. And that's what we've done. So now, poor Mother Earth is really suffering. And I think it's time for us to reach back to our true humanity and try to work with Mother Earth again and help to correct some of the mistakes that we've made. That's very true. That's very, very true. One thing I've seen and I've experienced in my own life is that so many people walk around life with fear. Oh, in their yeah. in their in their bodies, in their minds. Yeah. Every decision they make is based around fear. How did you overcome, if you still have overcome, fear in, in all aspects of your life? Because it seems like you're pretty fearless, my dear. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, life can be really scary, though, mm -hmm. you know, and it's easy to get stuck. But I figured out early on that if I keep looking at over my shoulder mm -hmm. at the bag of, of fear or what dark things that are hanging out on over my shoulder, I'm if I keep looking at that, I'm gonna get a stiff neck and I'm gonna have trouble pulling it back. Mm. You know, so it's that it's what we choose to do. And all through the path on you know this journey that we have had every day we have the right to choose whether we're going to enjoy this day or whether we're going to drag ourselves through it and uh i i don't I, I don't like just dragging myself through it i like to enjoy the fact that i can breathe and walk and 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 actually do some steps still mm. and see what I can see. My eyes aren't very good, but my insight has gotten better. So the actual eyesight is having trouble, but the insight says, oh, yeah, well, I can see things. Let me ask you, throughout your your decades of working in medicine, I've, I've spoken to many med uh, medical professionals who, you know, it's deal with life and death all the time when they're when they're doctors. What is the most miraculous story that you saw of, of someone going through something and coming out of it or a story of, you know, a near-death experience or somebody that came back, information on the other side? I'd love to hear your point of view on this. Well, let me tell you my story about my sister's passing on to the other dimension called death. My sister was in our family the the peacemaker i was a troublemaker and she was a peacemaker and it was it worked very nicely because she helped all through things and she lived to be 98 and she was healthy and doing what she liked to do and um then she got the flu and she didn't get over it and so when she was just ready to make the transition into the other dimension, her son and daughter-in-law were with her. And as she was lying there, she started singing. And she started singing hymns and uh, in, in English and hymns in, in Hindustani, which were bhajans. And every so often she would stop and she'd say, and Aya is here. Now Aya, was our like our second mother when we were growing up. She loved us and we loved her. And she taught Margaret and me to uh, play the dholak, which is a two-sided Indian drum. Mm -hmm. And so she's saying, 
to her children. And Aya is here. And to me, the picture of her with the I, with our Aya, drumming and singing as they're marching into the other dimension is the epitome of joy and happiness. Because that's that's the way she lived her life, and that's the way she stepped into every aspect of her life with, with that understanding of how good life was, no matter how it was, what aspect of life we were expect or expressing at that time. Gladys, let me ask you, can you tell people who are afraid right now of of death, of the passing or passing to the other side, that they're fearful of the experience? What advice do you have for them? Or that are seeing their loved ones go through that right now? What could you tell them to give them some comfort? Well, for me, and I think it's, I have to talk for myself. Of course. But for me, the experience that I've had with people in my family and patients and so on who have made the transition has been a true um, joy, not always, but very often. Like my dad, when my dad uh my mother died before my dad did and so he remarried and he when he was ready to uh well he got the flu and and got sick while he was back east and he decided he wanted to be buried out here because he knew that the end was coming mm -hmm. and so they came out we put him in the hospital and a couple of weeks later, Mother Daniels, who was the lady he married, and I went down, and we were with him as he was ready to make the transition. So she began singing, God be with you till we meet again. And he began singing it too. He could just mouth it, but he was mouthing it as she sang. And then he took his last breath, and moved right on. And um, so as we were leaving, she and I were leaving the hospital, and uh, she said, you know, she was talking about how wonderful that was, and she was singing it still as we were walking away. And I said to her, don't you know there is a jubilation on the other side right now? My mother is standing over there, and she's saying, now, John, it's time for you to come on over. Come on over. And so he's in the process of making that jubilant uh, passage of, of life from one dimension to the other. And that sort of a um, experience, an actual experience of watching people accept the reality of life on these dimensions has been to me a a, um, a a constant inspiration it's just it's amazing so you have you because of all your experience you have no fear you're just kind of just like when it's time it's time no it's kind of like going going to sleep in a and having a dream you know walking through the door of <clears throat> into a dream yeah of course of course one thing that i i find fascinating about you gladys is you know at least you might not see this but i see this your bravery and fearlessness especially uh you know starting to write books in 90 and and you know doing what you did in your lifetime with holistic medicine what advice do you have for somebody who's afraid of taking that leap that 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 jump to write that book to start that business to to move to that city that's going to give them possibly more opportunities to get over that hump because so many of us sit and wait until just making up excuses before we move it seems that you haven't so what advice do you have for that well uh, <laughs> if you don't step out and try it 
you don't, you'll never know. I mean, think of the experiences that you can miss. It, it's like starting the American Holistic Medical Association. When uh, when we started that, there were a group of us who were um, thinking about different dimensions of medicine, mm-hmm. and and there and so we thought, well, we we we're a group, so we we can start this. And um, so we just started the American Holistic Medical Association, but took us two years to figure out how to spell holistic because the word that we were looking for was health, healing, and holy for the uh, for holistic. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's the holistic medicine that we were looking for. And as we did that, we found out that, you know, the world was looking for it. And as the world was looking for it, we had opportunities to work with our patients and work Mm -hmm. with ourselves and our families, work with people in ways that that were uh, really objectionable to the medical community, enough so that um, I got called into uh, for disciplinary actions repeatedly. So, you know, these are things that have happened. Uh, this one day, one time I got called in uh, and in front, in front of Maricopa Medical Association for I forget what, what I, what I was doing. But anyway, they reprimanded me and I accepted the reprimand and I was walking out of the meeting and one of the doctors came up behind me and he tapped me and my, and my lawyer lawyer was walking ahead but the, this doctor t- tapped me on the shoulder and he said to me now let me tell you something honey whoa so he pushed a button in me and I turned around and I had my keychain in my hand and I started pounding him on his shoulder and I said don't you call me honey I'm your peer age wise and professionally and you will not call me honey and he kind of backed up and started walking away I looked at my lawyer he was doubled up on <laughs> laughing came <laughs> under the wall I went back to the office and told my daughter who was my partner in medicine and she says, oh, mom, you didn't. But I did. It was three years later when I appeared before them again. He was very, very respectful. But sometimes mm-hmm. you just have to, you know, create boundaries and and they pop up in front of you and you either have the opportunity or you don't. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it, it yeah, helped. Of course. Well, yeah, like they say, sometimes you got to show a little teeth, Gladys. <laughs> sometimes what? Sometimes you got to show a little teeth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they got to remember. <laughs> you got to got a little growl every once in a while. Yeah, it, I mean, yeah. it does sound like you were a troublemaker, Gladys. I mean, it does sound like you were a wonderful troublemaker. Well, I had a brother that was Carl Taylor, who uh, started human human generations around the world different groups that uh, he worked with. He was a doctor too, MD. And so he graduated from Harvard and and it's still going, future generations still going around the world, an amazing, amazing organization. And um, so, but he and I, the other kids um, really lived their lives the way they wanted to. But he and I kind of, um, well, teased each other in mm-hmm. a very loving and thoughtful way. But uh, but he pushed me, and I pushed him, and and so <laughs> you know it was a good uh, give and take as we were growing up, and uh, and it just has been helpful. For me all through my life beautiful beautiful how do you how do you see the intersection of spirituality and holistic medicine affecting the future of healthcare? well 
as we're watching it right now, you know, what's happening, I really believe that, that we humans are beginning to wake up and reach for our true humanity. Because I think we beginning to we're beginning to see and recognize the fact that we've really not done as much as we could have done as human beings to help Mother Earth as she has created this awesome place for us to live. I gotta I have to I have to imagine, I mean, even in my short lifetime, I've been able to see how humanity's consciousness has grown. There has been a shift from when I was yeah. around in the 70s to where I am now. A conversation like this wouldn't have existed 10 years ago, 20 years ago even, or, or older. I can't imagine seeing the difference between pre-World War II consciousness and consciousness today. What is the most awe-inspiring aspect of that shift? And do you agree that there has been that shift? Oh, yes. Uh, for me, the most Im important has been the reality that life and love are the two true healers. Healers, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. they life and love are what keep life going. And so it's that, that uh, ability of us, for us as human beings, to keep moving through life and love on into other dimensions of, of life, because that's the way it goes. Life has to move. If it stops moving, um, it dies. It can't, it can't not move. And so as we accept that and work with it, well, you know, um, I was so sick severely dyslexic when I was a kid, I had to repeat first grade twice. And oh. um, when when we started the American Holistic Medical Association, one day we were sitting, there were 10 of us sitting around a table talking about whatever. And we realized that of the 10 of us, six of us were severely dyslexic. So we latched on to the idea that even that process mm -hmm. was part of our being able to even think about having a different way of looking at medicine. So your quote unquote disability was actually your greatest strength. Oh, absolutely. Because you absolutely. were able to look at, you were able to look at things in a different way. You were looking at things outside the box because that's the tools you were given. Well, yeah, and, and in medical school it was that way because I, I started medical school uh, just as World War II started. You know, I started medical school in, in uh, September and, and the war started in December. So during the whole time during the war, we were being taught and and working through it. But I was asking questions enough so that the three times the the dean from our medical school sent me to the psychiatrist because she didn't think I had the right attitude. So, um, you know, Amazing. The, the psychiatrist sent me back to, to her and said, no, she's okay. <laughs> Well, that's good. At least you got some good psychiatrists that could understand who you were and you didn't get institutionalized. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm I'm sure that you've been asked this question a hundred times, but I, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your answer to this. What is the key to your longevity? What have you done physically, mentally, spiritually to reach this, to reach this milestone that you're at right now? Love. I love life. And 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 because I'm uh, able to wake up in the morning and look forward to another day, there's another day. Now, if I was still dragging myself through life and think, oh, 
not another day. <laughs> you know, I, I probably wouldn't live another day. But I'm telling you, the sun comes up. And you know what? I think that your mental, that mental attitude is what's telling your body. Not yeah. yet. Not yet. I still got stuff to do. I have purpose. I have mission. And your body's no. going, okay. But the opposite happens with like, oh, God, not another day. Like, oh, they, they don't want to be here. We could start shutting down any day now. <laughs> kind yeah, of Yeah, because, you know, uh, about uh, five weeks ago, no, it was longer than that, I fell and broke three ribs. But oh, they're so here sorry. now. You know, so, you know, they they heal. They heal. <laughs> They heal, no question about it. How? Do, what advice would you give to somebody seeking to integrate more holistic practices in their life? Start thinking about things that make you happy and things that you want to share with other people that you that, that are worth sharing. That whether it's medical or whether it's it's just a song, uh, it, like this. Uh, I have a a family in in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, that has mm -hmm. these grand great grandkids. Okay, so there is a, a three year old and a five year old and a seven year old, and then the family and they were they like Taylor Swift, so mm -hmm. they like her songs and they know her songs, and so she was uh, having some kind of an event or something, and they were. They were, uh, uh, um, I guess, on the TV or something. They were watching mm -hmm. it, but they mm -hmm. pushed all the furniture out in the living room, and they were dancing to it. Wow. Now, to me, <laughs> they 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 found something that was worth looking at and dancing with and having fun with, and those kids, those little ones. Will remember those. Those are the days that they'll look back on to and think, oh, remember when Taylor Swift and da 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 da. That's so beautiful. How do you define happiness? How do I define happiness? It's it's more than an emotion. It's it's a way a way of being. You know, we can be happy or we can be unhappy. Mm. And and we can get stuck in either one. And I don't want to be stuck in the happy. That's a simple answer. Very, very true. Very true. What have what have been the keys of the source of joy throughout your life? Oh, my my children, my life, my the way I worked with patients, my patients, my uh, siblings, uh, my community, that's the, that's the word I need. My community, which has always been a shifting community. Mm -hmm. It's been a growing and including, and then people move on and others move in. It's been a, an ongoing community. And it's been, I have the most amazing friends in the world. I, I mean, it's truly, truly awesome. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. What what role do you believe meditation or mindfulness should play in one's daily routine, especially in one's health? It depends on what you call meditation. You know, okay. some people look at a, a African daisy out here in the Arizona desert and just the very essence of spending time with that African daisy, I think, can be a time of meditation. Or some people just find ways of shifting in and out of spaces that allow them to reach to dimensions of consciousness that are, are a more that make them stretch themselves. In other mm -hmm. words, they, they uh, we know that there are other dimensions 
and maybe it's maybe it's the, the reality of paying attention to our dreams. If we do that, that's a way of of stretching ourselves. I find my dreams are really helpful, and a meditation or a way of reaching into the part of me that makes me happy and uh, stretches me from being, uh, you know, doing what I have to do <laughs> mm -hmm. into what, do what I really love to do. What essential habits or practices do you do to maintain mental and physical well-being, and spiritual for that matter? Well, I try to eat a, a decent <laughs> <laughs> diet. I don't recommend anything for other people because what I ate in India was completely different from what I'd eat here, and, you know, so forth and so forth. But um, have a diet that works for you, have a awareness that life is an ongoing process and that love and life are essential to making me happy and I want to be happy. There are times that are, that are very, very hard and I could get stuck in those times and there have been times when I've been stuck in those times, but able to actually move myself out of them by knowing that I could do that, that knowing that I don't have to be stuck. You know, that's it's a, it's a way of being aware that the divine that we are divine beings, and that we as divine beings have choice, and we can choose how we're going to live our lives, and and how we live our lives affects everybody around us. Mm -hmm. And as it's we a, take responsibility for that, it's a, it is a responsibility. It is a ripple effect, isn't it? How we live our lives ripples around to the people around us. Glass we, we create our own community, you know? Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and when you live as long as I have, that community has shifted, you know, from from the, the jungles of North India mm -hmm. into where we are right now. And I'm in a, my house with a walker. My I have a son who helps me with my everyday stuff. And uh, and I get around, but I don't. I, I walk outside and uh, with my walker. But I'm not going any place except look at what I'm doing with you. you know? <laughs> Very true. It's, it's that amazing taking what comes to you and using it for what makes you happy. So beautiful. That is so beautiful. Because with the amount of life that you've lived, you've seen a lot from World War II to all the other bad things that have happened in the world and good things that have happened in the world, negative, positive what is your outlook on the future of humanity based on what we're seeing right now? Because so many people say, oh, this is the worst time it's ever been. Uh, all these things, so many bad things happening in the world. Well, you've been around long enough to know when it really truly was the worst time to be yeah. around in the last hundred years. Uh, yeah. I argue that it, these last few years are nowhere near as bad as they were at the beginning of World War II. But that's my opinion. I'd love to hear your thoughts. No, I, I, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, no. no the, the, I think the opportunities that we have now mm. are so amazing. To the fact that I can talk to you in Austin, and I can talk to somebody in Cambodia, and I can talk to somebody in Ireland. Mm. Like this. I mean, yeah. how awesome is that? So yeah. to me, this moment is the most important moment. That's that's beautiful. In reflecting on your life's journey, are there any moments that stand out 
in particular as transformative or enlightening? Oh, well, uh, I talk about it in the book about the time when I, I saw that love and acceptance in Gandhi's eyes when I was 10 years old and saw that uh, and recognized it as a 10 year old of what what was happening. And I've still remembered it. Actually, we were in the process of coming back to the United States because my parents had a, a furlough every seven and a half years so they could come back and meet their family back home. Mm -hmm. And I, so we were leaving India and I didn't want to leave India. I didn't know what America was going to be like. I didn't like it, and I didn't want to leave. But I was in the train, and we were leaving India. And so I had my face sort of placed, placed on the window as we came into this uh, station. And, and there were in India, there are always groups of people. But there was a huge group of people here. And in front of them was a little man with, in his dhoti, which is the, the loincloth, and a walking cane. And he was just walking along. And and uh, a little, he just about as he came in, um, in, in where am I, I could look straight out at him. And... Um, he reached down as a little girl had picked a flower and was handing it up to him. And when he took the flower from the little girl, he looked up and looked straight into my eyes. And I was on the in the train and he was, it was Gandhi. And he wow. was there and the, the, the crowd was saying, Gandhiji, Gandhiji. And he was just walking along doing his thing. And, and the, the, love that I saw in his eyes still I still remember it but 30 years later I think it was that same ki kind of experience that my parents experienced with him because when the partition of India happened and Gandhi was stepping up and talking to his people my parents were working with him too on that so it's it's like love creates love and it goes on and it goes on and it's a living process and that's something I truly believe and I know is the truth. That's such a beautiful story. You, since you've lived so many years in India and also here in the States, you have a very unique perspective on both the West and the East. Uh -huh. uh, very, very similar to one of my, uh, one of my idol yogis that I I love to read, uh, um, Yogananda Paramahansa Yogananda, who also oh, yeah. spent a lot of time on both sides. What are the biggest lessons you learned while you were in India that you brought over to the West? Because I have to imagine it did affect you being in that in that country for so many years. Yeah, actually, not to be judgmental. You know, the Indian kids, when I was playing with the Indian kids, they would rub my arms trying to get the white off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't fly as easily today. <laughs> no, you know. So how do you judge something like that? I mean, these were my friends. Sure. And, uh, so <laughs> anyway, it's it's the ability to take people where they are and and uh, look for the, what's really the true human within that aspect of, of that being that you're, mm. that you're working with. And most of the time, you can find something good. And sometimes there are some people that are really hard to <laughs> <talk> <laughs> to, to love. <laughs> <laughs> but but, you know, you can work at it. <laughs> well, let me ask you, how do you, how did you or how do you deal with people who are not doing good things? You know, people who are maybe lost or have have wandered off the main path 
and are just trying to figure things out, but they're doing things that are not very nice, let's say. How do you deal with that? Well, I figure that's their karma. I don't have to carry that baggage. I've got enough of my own. <laughs> and so, you know, I don't need to judge them but, on their dragging them behind them or carrying or whatever it is. And, you know, I I have a really dear friend who a few months ago, I was talking to her and she says, oh, I wake up in the morning and I think, oh, not another day. And I thought, you know, that 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 hurt me to feel that that's the way she felt when she woke up each day. I mean, yeah. and and I got to feeling really badly for her and decided that I had no right to de judge even that because if that's what she chooses, what am, who am I to judge it? Very true. Are there any spiritual practices that you do or have done in your lifetime that have been impactful in your journey? Well, you know, <laughs> the Indian hymns, which are called bhajans, and mm -hmm. and the English hymns and so on. It's I have. It's sort of like a, a tape that runs through my brain <laughs> all the time because anytime I kind of stop to take a breath, one of these comes floating through, and uh, at night I wake up and uh, I uh, walk down memory lane, and these, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a joyous time. And uh, so um, I have my times of meditation, but they're not... Uh, proscribed. They're, they're <laughs> times that move in as life moves on. Yeah, okay, fair enough. How do you envision the future of holistic medicine, especially how it's going to hopefully integrate with traditional and modern practices? Well, I'm, I'm praying and hoping that the uh, work that I'm doing with this book will help. And I think mm -hmm. it is because people are reaching back to me with questions and um, and really looking for their true humanity. Mm. It's very true. I mean, I imagine that throughout your career as a doctor, you've seen opinions change. You've seen oh. appro approaches change, things that they were so so stuck on before and now they're opening. I mean, just the concept of meditation, it was thought to be weird and wacky. And now there's so much evidence that proves just on a physical standpoint, the ben health benefits. So I imagine that, oh. that you've seen a lot of that. Oh, well, you know, when biofeedback started, that mm -hmm. whole process, that was a huge step into the, the uh, acceptance of meditation. Mm -hmm. Very so true. So they responded to different, different terms to speak about things, but really, as life has moved, it's moved through and been and brought life with it. What do you think is the most crucial message you would like to send to healthcare professionals working today? That life and love are the two healers. The, if you, you know, I created <laughs> in my head the five L's. Mm -hmm. The first two L's go together. Life and love, it's like a pregnancy. You know, the, the baby is uh, uh, part of the mother, everything that she does until the baby takes its first breath and then becomes a living being in, in its own right. But as long as the mother is doing everything for it, they are one. So those two go together. The third L is laughter. Laughter <laughs> without love is cruel. It's 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 mean. 
It breaks families apart. It causes wars. But laughter with love is joy and happiness. And the fourth one is labor. Labor without love is, oh, like I, life's too hard. I'm just dragging myself through it. And uh, too many diapers, all that kind of, just life is just too hard. But light, la labor with love is bliss. It's why you're doing what you're doing. It's why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's what makes our hearts sing. It's joy and happiness. And and the um, fifth one is listening. Listening without love is empty sound. The calling gang, 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 you know. If you don't listen, you don't hear it. But listening with love is understanding. And for mm -hmm. me, these five L's have sort of um, uh, put things in context so I can deal with them in, in sort of reasonable ways. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing tool set to say the least. If there was yeah. one question, if there was one question you wish more people would ask themselves, what would that be about leaving a living a fulfilled and meaningful life? Well, I, I would like to know who they are. You know, who are you? If I have the opportunity to uh, meet a new person and don't know who they are, it, it's a pretty interesting journey to take. Very true. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. What is your definition of living a fulfilled life? Taking every moment as it comes and using it the best you can. Sometimes you don't do a very good job and you regret it, but then, you know, that's, those things happen. And, uh, but you know, use what comes, use it the best you can. And if you make a mistake, well, you know, it's there, it'll go away. <laughs> Learn from it and move on. Yeah. If you had a chance to go back in time and speak to little Gladys, what advice would you give her? You keep laughing, keep singing, keep dancing, <laughs> keep going. Because it's going to be a trip. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be one heck of a trip, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. How do you define God or source energy? I don't try to d define God for anybody else. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's love and life. Well, for you, what is love? Love is what you experience when <clears throat> when you know that, that that some part of what it is that you're experiencing at the time is real. And it's for for, yeah, it's for real. it It is love. It's there. And it's life. It and you're feeling it for real in all aspects of life. Yeah. That love, that labor, that love of, of a human being. Uh, right. Everything, all of it. That's beautiful. And, and it what it exists, and it exists in living things. Mm. Let me I, let me tell you a quick story. <laughs> please, I have please. A friend, uh, James, and he was a family friend, spent time at our dinner table and all of that. He was a good family friend. And then he moved into dementia. And so we found a really nice home where he could be lived and taken care of. And um, one day I went over and I took him a little plant. It was just a little plant in, in a pot. And I said to him, now, James, now, he's not paying much attention to what I'm saying, but I, 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 so I didn't know whether he was getting this or not. But I said, here's this plant. I'm giving it to you for you to take care of. But it's, it's going to need water and it's going to need sunshine. And so if you'll just take care of it, uh, I'm giving it to you and I'm putting it in your 
window here. And, you know, we I talked about it a little bit more, and then I left. A and the next week, I came back, and he met me at the door, and he said, magic, magic. And I said, what, 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 what? And he says, look, box. And he takes me by the hand, and he goes over to the air conditioning box, and he says, box, push this button, everything cool. <laughs> plant, plant loves cool. Push this button, oh, everything hot. Plant doesn't like hot. And I realized that he had understood what I had said and actually that the life of that little plant had given him a connection that he could make with me and his surroundings. I mean, it was, uh, I'm just still in awe of wow. that experience that we had. That's so beautiful. That's amazing. My final question, what is the ultimate purpose of life? To live it. As simple as that. Gladys, where can people find out more about you, uh, the work that you are doing, and to pick up your book, The Well-Lived Life? Well, we've got a, a new uh, edition. Well, well, the paperback edition is coming out, John, when? Uh, Tuesday, April 2nd. April okay. 2nd. And it'll come out around the world. And it's it's the well lived. Can order it. You can yeah, order you can, it right now. People could order yeah. it right now. On Amazon and, and anywhere books are sold. Yeah. And Gladys, do you have any party messages for the audience? You can tell them about GladysMcGarry.com too. Oh you can order it by GladysMcGarry.com. Uh what did you ask me? I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, no problem. Uh, what uh, Do you have any parting messages for the audience? Yes. yes. Don't give up on yourself. <laughs> you know, you're a creative being who is constantly changing. Every life has to move in order to be able to, to keep on. And so look for the light. Don't don't get stuck in the darkness. Or if you do, then start looking for the light because it's always there. It never goes away. It's always there. So keep looking. Gladys, it has been a pleasure and an honor speaking to you today. Thank you so much for not Thank only the work you've done throughout your life, but what you're doing in this chapter of your life. And I look forward to the many more chapters you have ahead of you and the work <laughs> that you're doing. So Gladys, hey. thank you again, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Love everybody. Thanks for watching. Click on one of the videos below to continue your journey. And don't forget to subscribe.